This is Weird on the Rocks, a podcast that explores the weird, unusual, strange, and unexplained, all while getting our drink on. Join me every other Monday as I share a different cocktail and discuss true crime, paranormal stories, unexplained phenomena, conspiracy theories, and much more. Find Weird on the Rocks on social media, the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com, and listen on all of your favorite podcast apps. And don't forget to cheers and stay weird. Mystery on the Rooftop No Ride Home Berkshire's UFO All three of these episodes were recently released through Netflix on the new Unsolved Mysteries that was put out this past summer. Marcus A. Clark was the director of these three episodes. I am thrilled that he agreed to be on the show today and go into his background and how he got into filmmaking and maybe filmmaking wasn't his number one passion when he was uh, growing up, or was it? We're going to get into all of that and much more. So from the young boy that grew up and was born in Brooklyn, New York, and had worked with Spike Lee and his team and many, many other projects, I am your host, Al Cooley, host of Ghosts in the Valley, and here is my exclusive interview with Marcus A. Clark. Hello, Marcus, and thank you for uh, joining me on Ghost in the Valley's Berkshire's UFO. And I'm excited that you got back to me and to share your experiences on working on this episode. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to talking about the show and, and bringing back Unsolved Mysteries. I see that you're a director, producer, filmmaker. Which one do you like the best? I mean, directing? Yeah, directing, directing is definitely... Um, what I like the best, it's where my passion is, it's what I enjoy the most. Um, but all, you know, on the path to directing, um, I was a producer first. Uh, and so I got a lot of experience from producing um, for different directors and different genres, whether that's commercials or um, you know, fashion or documentaries. Uh, you know, a lot of producing goes in there. And then the filmmaker, you know, for me, just as a distinction, you know, a filmmaker is a little different than both. A filmmaker can can take an idea from, you know, from the conception, from the ideation, um, and then, you know, take it all the way through the process of creating it through post, through the edit and delivering it. So the filmmaker term is a little bit more all inclusive um, of somebody who can create films and kind of any, any type of content, but directing is really my passion. And that's really what I'm focused on most um, right now. I see you uh, have some experience working with Spike Lee. That ought to be exciting. That's right. That's yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, it was a, it a lot younger then uh, in my in my younger years, but um, you know, I, I did start out uh, um, being a gopher for Spike Lee. So I would actually fly to Spike where he was shooting, wherever he was filming, pick up the film because at that time they actually did still shoot film, um, and then I would have to fly it back to New York and get it to the processing center. So you know, sometimes that was international, so I had to deal with customs and that kind of thing. But it was. You know, at the time, I was a production assistant, pretty low on the uh, on the level of production there. But it was very exciting times because, you know, here I am, you know, 17, 18 year old kid um, traveling around, picking up Spike Lee's footage <laughs> and dropping it off. So it was an important experience <laughs> in my life. Right. And working with like uh, ass assistant director uh, Mike Ellis. I mean, you have to I mean, that's got to be great to learn from people like that. Yeah. Yeah, man. When, when I um, when I first linked up with Spike. You know, it should be noted that, you know, I, I started in, in commercials first when I was 16 years old. I was very fortunate to get an opportunity at a young age for a commercial company that did, you know, everything from Tropicana commercials to Long John Silver's and Pizza Hut. So at a very, very young age, I was kind of indoctrinated on set in terms of, you know, how film practices go, how to manage a film set, 
and in that environment. So by the time I got to to Spike Set, which was probably about six years, you know, into my production experience, at that time I wanted to be a first assistant director. And Mike Ellis is, you know, a legendary first assistant director for Spike Lee, for music videos, for films, and he was really a, a glaring example of what an incredible first direct, assistant director was. And so I took to him, and that was kind of where I learned a lot of um, the AD skills in terms of how to run a set, schedule an actual shoot, and just how to you know wield the, the the command of the actual set in the different departments. So that was really impactful. And then the closer I got to the assistant director role, you know, the more I could pick up little things here and there from Spike. And so that was a really important kind of time in my development. So I figure you know you know r- running for like Spike Lee, you had to really you know get your feet wet and you know and teaches you a lot on maybe on ideas that you have, you know, in different ways you can approach it. Yeah, of course. It was, you know, it was a really, it was a fortunate learning experience. And like, you know, Spike is a very specific director compared to a lot of other directors. He's very specific. He's very strict, you could say, in terms of what the expectations are from the crew. And so being around that environment, it's also like a family. You know, the people who work with him kind of always work with him on different projects. You see a lot of the same faces on set. So it becomes very familiar but just getting that experience and being able to see him work and be close enough to overhear some conversations and just, you know, take all of that inspiration into what I wanted to do, you know, had a really big impact, you know, on my on my creativity, on what I wanted to do and what I thought was possible. So, yeah, it was a very, very impactful experience working with Spike, even if I was just gophering and delivering, you know, footage or being a production assistant. At that time, it was, you know, that was everything for me. I was wide eyed and, you know curious and interested and kind of just absorbing everything I could. Looking at your uh, bio, you had, what, over 20 years of experience in uh, commercial production. That's right. Yeah. You know, because I started so young, you know, I I got my start in the business at at 16. You know, I was still in high school, technically. Uh, And as an intern, a production assistant, I worked for the same company for about seven years. So, you know, if I went away to school and I'd come back, I'd be working at this commercial production company. So, you know, I had a lot of experience, advanced experience, um, because the company I was working for, they shot really big budget commercials, like big Lifesavers commercials. And when they used to shoot all commercials practically, so like there was no CGI, there was models and recreations of Doritos chips and chocolate bars and wafers that we would throw into tanks of milk. And, you know, it was very high end production. So, you know, I was very, very lucky to see all that and to just kind of be a fly on the wall while director Santiago Suarez would, would do his thing. And so it was, you know, I, I was able to absorb all that very young. So that, that gave me an edge, I would say, in the business. Yeah, I want to thank you for sending me over to Justin uh, Genowitz. It was really enlightening talking to him. I was looking at his uh, three points of view of looking at the core of filmmaking. You know, l- number one being simplicity, like, you know, simple is the best. And number number two was story comes first. And three was Filmmaking is a team effort, so to say. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a huge collaborative collaborative effort. I mean, filmmaking is an extremely difficult process. Um, if you're talking long form, whether it's a series or an actual documentary feature, you know, it's really you, you need a lot of people. You need a lot of different departments. You need a lot of you know people who have special skills in, in different departments. And you know, I always like to say, you know, director is only as good as his crew. That's very true. You know, it's like, yes, the director gets a lot of the credit and gets the name and this and that. But every time you see a director succeed, it's because of their team. You know, it's because of the crew that's behind them. It's because of the professionals they work with. And similarly, you know, and, and you know, Elon Musk has said this, but similarly, if a director fails, that's all on the director. You know, it's like a, it's like a flip of the kind of paradigm, like the responsibility and you know, all, all comes down to you. So if, if you fail and the project isn't what it's supposed to be or, you know, isn't uh, winning, so to speak, it, it does kind of all come down to the director. But the win has to be shared, you know, definitely with the team, because that's the only way to to really get there and to get the kind of excellence that you need to make really good quality content. Uh, I see you, when you were growing up, you're born in uh Brooklyn, New York. That's right. Born and raised. Born and raised in Brooklyn. When you were in school as a youngster, <laughs> you know, when the when the teachers ask you, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Was your thought ever to become a director, producer, filmmaker? You know, what's funny, um, I wanted to be a director and a filmmaker, but at that time, you know, let's say between, you know, anywhere between 16 and, and 20, 20, let's say, <laughs> or 21, um, I actually wanted to go into computer science, strangely enough. 
I was still doing all the film work, but I had I had spent a, a good amount of time like learning website design and and um, HTML protocol and flash animations. And I was working on like a very technical side of kind of what my interests were, very into technology and like future things. So I was very kind of going in that direction. And then oddly enough, I went to school, I went to college in Middlebury, Middlebury, Vermont. And during that time, my, my major was actually computer, computer science. And because I had started computer science in high school, I already had some skills. So, you know, I came into a 101 class that was probably like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, you know, my first year of college. And I'm basically sleeping through every class, to be honest with you, because it's 101. Came down to my, my midterm and I do like a, you know, a big website and flash and there's animations and there's fade. There's all this kind of stuff happening. And my, my professor didn't believe that I had done the site. I actually thought it was plagiarism. It had put me up against the school basically saying that I'd, there's no way I could have known how to design a site like this. They didn't teach it. It was too advanced. They thought I cheated. Long story short, I ended up out of that experience, which I didn't really like. I changed my major to film and that was kind of all she wrote. So like I was going in a very different trajectory my first year in college. And then after that experience, and, and don't get me wrong, I love the school I went to. I love Middlebury College. I had an incredible experience there. But this freshman year thing that happened really just put a bad taste in my mouth in terms of pr pursuing computer science. So I stepped away from that and I went full, you know, full throttle with the film stuff. Isn't it funny when how life comes at you, uh, you never think what's going to happen. You think you're going to be a doctor, and then next thing you know, you're a, you're a hairdresser. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that might not be a very good terminal officer, but you know what I'm saying. No, but a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You just never know. You never know. And and you know, it's not all, it's not all glory. There was, you know, there was a time when, you know, I was still, you know, struggling to to make the next rounds up, like you know, elevate in the business. I did a couple years. Uh, I did about five years or so working for Victoria's Secret, and I was doing a lot of cool, like behind the scenes Victoria's Secret shoots and you know, online fashion shoots. And I was there with all the models and all the big shoot. I was like part of it. And at one point, a sound guy, I told, I told my friend, the sound guy, Richard, I told him the story that I just told you, you know, that I was focusing on computer science and I wanted to be a web designer. And then, you know, this thing happened and my parents screamed racism. And then I was like, I can't do computer science anymore. And I went back to film and he looked at me and he said, can you, and this is when I'm a production assistant for Victoria's Secret. And he's like, can you imagine where you would have been if you just stayed with computer science? Right. You could be at Google, you could be at Apple. And I'm like, it, at that time, I'm a young kid, I'm a young man and I'm working for Victoria's Secret. I'm like, I'm at Victoria's Secret, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm happy right here. I mean, I'll carry the cases, but I'm happy right here. But uh, it just goes to show you, you never know how things are going to pan out. I see you, saw, you also work for CNN. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So the first the first big feature film, feature documentary I did was uh, what I produced was Fresh Dress. And that was a CNN film, you know, funded by CNN when the CNN Films Division kind of had just kicked off. They did a bunch of really important films. Fresh Dress was one of them. I did that with a company called Mass Appeal. Um, the director was Sasha Jenkins, really incredible director. A man I've produced for, you know, a while in the past for Mass Appeal, incredibly talented director. And, we, you know, we did Fresh Dressed and we took it to Sundance and you got an incredible, you know, reception at the premiere of Sundance. Um, and it was really an incredible experience. And that really explores the history of urban fashion, hip hop fashion, as you could say, um, mm -hmm. you know, from the late 70s, early 80s, you know, to 20, I think it was 2012 or 2014 when we did it. So, you know, really kind of a history lesson on the history of hip hop fashion and how a lot of those brands got kind of absorbed into higher fashion brands, uh, legacy brands kind of in their rise and in their decline. This latest release on Netflix with the uh, Unsolved Mysteries, this isn't your first rodeo with uh, Netflix. That's right. It isn't. It isn't. You know, I've been doing a lot of work for Netflix uh, over the past few years. It's, you know, they're an incredible partner. They're an incredible client. I love working with them. There's, you know, there's a certain amount of creative freedom and creative liberty that Netflix allows, which virtually does not exist within the, within the rest of kind of long form and streaming kind of platforms in terms of how much they allow the creativity to drive, you know, the content that you're making. And so, you know, Fresh Dressed, strangely enough, before Netflix Originals, you know, took over the world, Fresh Dressed was one of the films that they had licensed, you know, back in, back when it had come out. At that time, Netflix was licensing a lot of films and documentaries that were made already. Fresh Dress was one of those early on. After the success of Fresh Dress, Mass Appeal got a deal to do Rapture, which was an eight-part hip-hop series, an immersive, highly immersive hip-hop series, um, each episode driven on a different artist and addressing, you know, a different 
factor or component of the larger kind of hip hop world, hip hop culture. I mean, so it's a deep dive into these celebrities' lives, what the reality is of being a celebrity. And that was a Netflix original series that we did. I did three of those episodes and it did really well. Now, did that lead you into the new uh, Unsolved Mysteries? It did to some degree, but there's a, you know, there's a small actual lapse of time in between Rapture and Unsolved Mysteries. I did another series, believe it or not, for Netflix that hasn't, hasn't aired or come out yet, but I had done another series in between, and that series really helped kind of catapult me towards uh, Unsolved Mysteries, along with the documentary I did with um, Future, uh, entitled The Wizard on Apple Music. You know, that's another kind of hip-hop documentary, but it's about a real kind of like a superstar of hip-hop and like watching his rise, documenting his rise. And in that, because the star himself, Future, is so mysterious and elusive and he has a brand mystery kind of around him, I put a lot of those themes into his film and into his documentary. Because I think, you know, in these days, in the present, with so much documentary content and so much, you know, competition, so to speak, you know, infusing narrative themes into these documentaries, whether it's suspense, mystery, intrigue, making sure there's an arc, like all of these themes that are kind of narrative at their heart, you know, are, are being infused into the documentary world. So I did that with Future. And I think that caught a lot of attention in terms of how can we create more mystery, more suspense, you know, with this type of director, applying that kind of creative ethos to Unsolved Mysteries on the brand. You had mentioned that you had probably a little more creativity or freedom, I should say, with uh, Netflix than say you would with ABC, NBC. Absolutely. I noticed that in a couple of the episodes on uh, Unsolved, was, you know, you would never hear that type of language or even, say, commercial breaks, you know. So right. uh, I think it, it really, I mean, <laughs> I, I told Justin this, you know, I, I thought it was phenomenal. I really did. I really thought the camera Thank work you. and everything was just, because really you have to tell the story with the camera and the people in that story because you don't have anybody like Robert Stack doing that for you now. That's right. That's right. So the, the storytelling and the conventions that we use, you know, have to be, you know, there's twofold. It has to be way more immersive, number one, which it kind of is by virtue of, like you said, no commercials and no host. And you're really, it's really character driven. It's really about the subjects. It's really about their emotions. But you have to have a lot of, you know, you have to be able to build in enough context. You have to be able to build in enough of the actual information and the clues and the the what do we know about the situation. So there's a lot of that to work into it. But then again, you know, the, the visuals have to be compelling. And like I'm saying, with like a lot of competition and a lot of, you know, true crime mystery shows are, are hot right now. You know, this is, you're talking about like one of the hottest genres in streaming. And so how you approach recreations and how you approach the visual aesthetic really has to be dialed in if you want to stand out. So there's a lot of things we will do and won't do, you know, pertaining to the series that really becomes the, the, you know, the brand, so to speak, the identifier of the show. Because you're telling a story with the camera, but you're also not trying to show anything that is too vivid or too like, you know, you don't want to handhold the audience. You want to allow them to kind of break down the visuals that's happening, you know, as they unfold to understand what the story is. You must have did a great job because it's, <laughs> it's a number one watched miniseries on Netflix this summer. That's right. That's right. Number one, number one, and number one globally for a good amount of time, which is, you know, beyond everyone's wildest expectations. So I'm very, very happy to hear that. I reached out to a few of my podcaster friends and, you know, for my final episode on this, it's going to be like a round table with friends of mine in the paranormal field and their comments on the series or on the show, Berkshire's UFO. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me when I have a friend of mine in England texting me saying, you know, wow, it was a powerful series, you know, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, and somebody from Japan, you know, texting oh, wow. the same thing. So, you know, it, it really hits home when you know people that around the world are watching this, you know, how right. it affects them. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, here's what I'll say, like, Unsolved Mysteries as a brand, as a show, from its inception is kind of ahead of it, way ahead of its time, in terms of, you know, the call to action, having the audience engaged and calling in with tips. You know, the original show didn't have the internet as a backbone. And so now in this new, in this world that we live in, you know, the show coupled with the internet is just a really wildly, you know, compelling, but also just, it, it just, it's more effective um, because people can communicate, people can share information like you're describing people from Japan or from England or from Australia, wherever people are all sharing information and seeing this stuff. 
and it creates a conversation. Whereas in the past, it did the same thing, but it was a much slower burn, much slower results, much slower coverage from the press. And now with the Netflix platform, the reach is just so extensive. You know, Netflix is in 190 countries. And so they're everywhere. <laughs> right. Before you had to watch it on, a, like, say, you know, ABC or whatever, and it was on the one time, then you, if you want to watch it again, you had to wait for the uh, rerun. That's right. And now you have, you can uh, stream it, stream it on your iPhone or your iPad or any device, really, and whenever you want. And most importantly, you can press pause and then rewind and then rewind like that's simple now but you couldn't do that before like you had to catch it in the moment you had to be sitting down on your couch at that half hour at that hour like that was it now you can pick it up and watch it whenever you want you can stop you can rewind you can look back at the details look back at the clues oh what did they say about this and rewind straight to it so like the paradigm has shift and so I think that's a good part of why it's, you know, why it's so successful. And then, you know, people like my, like I watched the show growing up. I grew up watching the show, you know, with my parents late at night when I shouldn't have been, you know, <laughs> so I was also very familiar with the style, with how it makes you feel, with the aesthetic, with the whole, you know, with the whole vibe. So I was really put in a super fortunate position to be able to help bring the show back because not only am I making content for right now, which is kind of, you know, I would say, you know, respectfully on the, you know, on the cutting edge of documentary filmmaking, but I have this memory of the show. So it was much easier for me to kind of visualize and pair what does this show look like in 2020? You know, what is Unsolved Mysteries in 2020? Because the, the, the line, what people don't understand is the line between something being spooky, scary, and enthralling and something being corny and unbelievable and like bad essentially is very thin <laughs> especially especially in 2020 you can't do these cheesy recreations everything has to be a whole different style of of how you're approaching it you know there's a higher bar three episodes you worked on on the unsolved was uh, mystery on the rooftop no ride home mm -hmm. and the berkshires ufo naturally uh my my things on the berkshires but my sister and I, we were just talking last night, and she just totally loved the uh, No Ride Home because mm -hmm. it, like, really hit home. Like, you know, I mean, somebody out there knows something about this. Absolutely. I think, like I was telling Justin, I mean, it has to be the, the icing on a cake is when one of these cases are solved, you know, and you're part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the, you know, that's the goal. That's the you know, I don't want to say the dream, but it's kind of the dream. Like, we, you know, making documentaries that affect change is always kind of the cornerstone and like, you know, that gets awareness to certain things. But this show and, the, you know, this style interacts with reality, with real reality in a way that is just different um, and way more powerful. So, you know, next to America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries has the highest rate of cases actually being solved. Um, the actual statistic escapes me right now, but I think it's like one in four or one in five um, have gotten solved in the course of the show's you know tenure. So yeah, I mean that that is a dream to be able to affect change. But it's like this story, the Alonzo story, No Ride Home, was way more personal for me for a lot of very obvious reasons. You know, I'm an African American. You know, I've obviously grown up in this country and dealt with what I've dealt with. So you know, like I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to get a very crazy opportunity at a very young age, which has made the difference in my life. And so if I can take those skills and the things that I've learned and apply them in a way that's going to help people who are also, you know, who have gone through a similar experience or have gone through a, you know, a worse experience, you know, I feel in some ways, in many ways, obligated and compelled, obviously, to do those things. And so the Alonzo episode was really very difficult for me. It was very challenging emotionally. Um, it was very challenging being there, physically being in this area of Kansas. And so there's a lot of that energy I tried to put into it, um, to put directly into that film. So if something does come out of it, if some justice comes out of it, I know the case is reopened by the FBI. You know, that's all we can, we can hope for and dream for. That would be the highest kind of goal and achievement of the show. And the family deserves it. You know, it's, it's bigger than just entertainment at that point. I'll be right back with the conclusion of my interview with Marcus A. Clark after these brief messages. This is Cindy Martinez, the host of Welcome to the Neighborhood podcast. Ever since I was young, I've had a passion for true crime and the paranormal. 
This podcast focuses on cases and stories from different cities while making the Chicagoland my hometown or base. If you find yourself intrigued by crime and all things spooky, find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google. We post new episodes every Friday. Be sure to stop by. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, you have to get, I mean, really connected with the family and, you know, pull your strings that way. Uh, you know, as you're on your way home on the plane, plane or whatever, you know, you have to be thinking about, you know, that mother, what she's going through, you know, and, you know, they're out there, what, four, six, four to six hours. And they, they find this body, you know, in the FBI and the police. And I don't know if it, if you filmed that or if maybe I missed it, but the shed, you know, where they had, she had mentioned it's no longer there, but maybe his body might've been in, might've been in there. And what did nobody check the shed? That's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's, what's, what's very, what's crazy about what you just, you know, the shed moment. Right. Um, and I think I can share this, but while we were there, they pointed out that there was this, you know, shed missing that he could have been in the shed. We filmed where the shed was. And the only reason, and this is the most bizarre, you know, I'm sure you're, your listeners will enjoy this because of the paranormal aspect. They pointed to the area where the shed was. And based on the time of day that we were there shooting, the sun created almost a shadow, an imprint, if you will, into the tree line of where the shed was. And so almost like if you're a kid looking at a coloring book or something, you could see an indentation in the tree line of exactly where the shed was, like a, a perfect triangular box imprint where the tree growth had grown around the shed and now the shed's not there so you could essentially just you know draw in where the shed was we filmed that actual scene unfortunately it didn't make it into the final cut which i think it would have been really important just to see how creepy this area of the tree line was where the shed was and the bizarre thing about that is you know i asked justin i said you know if you can film it let's let's film it let's get it on camera he got he gets it on camera Later in the day, you know, five hours later, we're still in the same location filming, but the sun has moved into a different position in the sky. And now we cannot see where the indentation was. And so for that moment, for that brief, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, where the the location of the shed was visible for that time because of where the sun was. (laughs) Maybe Alonzo was giving you a message, you know, (laughs) you know, look here, look here, you know. Let me tell you, man, there was... You know, and I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, I don't want to go too far off the deep end, but there were there were numerous, multiple times in which something like this occurred, that was very bizarre. That that felt like we were being nudged to look in a certain direction or to look at things and to pay attention to certain things. There was a lot of different, very peculiar things that happened in that creek and around that area on those grounds. Um, but I have trouble explaining, and that's one of them. And the only reason that one is so particularly crazy is because we, we did actually film where the shed was um, and it was in a bizarre area. And, you know, it starts, you start to then ask yourself questions like, well, this whole area is farmland, raw farmland. Why would you, why would you remove a shed? Why would you burn a shed down or remove it or whatever you did? There are sheds all over the place. This is empty acres of land. Where did this, where did the shed go? His DNA is probably in that shed. You know what I'm saying? That's correct. I would, I would imagine so. My sister's going to be happy because she, you know, well, she has African American children, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and it does hit home. Like if you know, like her grandson, you know, it could, it could have been her grandson, it could have been anybody's, you know, and when and with the racism and everything that goes on, and even to this day, you know, and maybe they wouldn't, uh, they they pursued it at a different rate than they would say. I hate to say it, but you know, like a white kid, of course, you know, course. but. I thought you did a really good job on that. And that was one of probably, I like that one as much <laughs> as the Berkshires, you know, of course they were all good, you know, but uh, uh, getting to the Berkshires. Yeah. I must say, since I interviewed almost everybody, <laughs> Tom Reed, Tom Warner, Melanie, uh, but they all, even a few of the crew I, I've talked to, mm-hmm. I must say they all loved working with you. That's I thought you were very professional oh, thank and you, uh, you uh, they just enjoyed their time with you and uh, sharing their story. They said they didn't feel like they were uh, a kook or anything, you know, they right, didn't, right. 
you looked at it the way they looked, the way they seen it in 1969. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, I had a, I really enjoyed my time, you know, speaking to all of them and making this film in particular, you know, like, like I said, the Alonzo thing was very personal to me for, for obvious reasons, but the UFO thing, you know, has been an interest of mine in UFO topic has been an interest of mine forever since I was a kid, you know, to now to the, to the present, like I've always been interested in this topic and this content. And I've always been bothered by, you know, the, the, the kooky aspect of how many filmmakers, ta you know, approach this subject where it's not taken seriously. There's almost this edge of trying to get the audience to laugh or to think that they're quirky or funny or weird or out there. And it really defeats and deflates kind of the purpose and the authenticity. You know, my job is to come in there, especially with an episode like this, and to see what they saw, to visualize what they, that experience was like and to try to get out as much information and details around what they can remember as possible. Now, in that process, there might be some, you know, I'm keeping record of all the things I'm, I'm asking, all the questions and the details. So as I go from one person to the next, I might be looking for some discrepancies or, you know, a, a difference of opinion or something. But ultimately, I'm not there to question whether or not these people are out of their minds or not you know you have unless i'm given some kind of reason to think otherwise everyone is is you know uh is an upstanding you know moral person that is 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 telling me the truth you know what i mean and i'm, I'm there we vet these people and i'm there to kind of facilitate what that truth is um and what and what you know we through the details on what happened so you know i had a lot of respect for them and i respect that they came forward to share their stories which made it you know which made the show what it is but it's those kind of people who need to be brave and have to come forward with an issue that they've been criticized for, you know, for years because of the history of how the subject is treated. You know, people are ostracized, people are called crazy, people don't want to share their stories, other people make fun of them. And so part of this was to, you know, approach this like I would approach any other documentary and not judge the subject matter before making the film. When I reached out to, uh, get some comments on this on you know into different facebook groups and twitter and instagram and i was getting i was amazed i got a few stories back from people at that time around different areas of the berkshires who actually seen the ufo that night mm -hmm. one even told me they called it in and was told like portrayed like they were crazy you know, so they didn't even pursue it after that, you know. And another person told me uh, he was under the light. He wasn't abducted, mm -hmm. but he was under the light of the UFO. Mm -hmm. And at that, at that time, he was 27 years old. But And he, he always had a problem and then was uh, hospitalized because of his migraine headaches. But since that, that night, he's never had another migraine headache. Oh, wow. You know, and, uh, you know, stories like that, you know, and that, that, that you know, naturally didn't come forward or wasn't on Netflix, you know, but, mm. uh, yeah, I was amazed on the amount of people that contacted me that has, you know, whether it be in New York or Connecticut, Massachusetts, you know, they, they had a story to share. Right. Right. I think times are changing when it comes to, to people sharing their story. I mean, one, because, you know, you see, you have outlets like this, you know, Netflix that are kind of, you know, putting the subject matter forward and making, normalizing it in a way. But then also, and we talk about this in the episode, but, you know, the New York Times, the government, you know, has, has basically admitted that UFOs exist. So like kind of the, the biggest announcement, the biggest awakening moment in, in, in human history in many ways has already taken place. And people aren't really paying attention. There's a lot of other things going on in the world. So that makes sense why everybody's not paying attention. But you know, the Navy has released videos, actual video from fighter jets of UFOs in action. And so they've come forward and said, these things exist. And so more people who have felt like don't want to share their story or don't want to talk about it are probably feeling more comfortable now to talk about it because there's some acknowledgement that this phenomenon is real. And so I think, you know, I honestly think that the trauma of not being believed and the trauma of how the subject matter has been treated has you know discouraged people from ever coming forward to talk about it, but I think those times are changing now. Oh, I I, I think so. You know, it's like I was telling Justin. You know, I had a, a conversation with a fighter pilot from the Navy who, uh, as he put it, was on a dogfight with one. You know, over uh, Skinwalker Ridge, mm -hmm. and 
It was amazing because I, I look at his story. I look at the stories that happened in my county back in 1994 with the UFOs over Trumbull County. So I look at all these incidences, you know, and, and how they, they all have one similarity that that craft didn't make any noise. That's right. You know, and like the pilot was telling me, you know, it's when he's estimating around 6,000 miles an hour. And he says, I'm probably being too lenient with that number. <laughs> but he, he says, but it's amazing that, you know, what he's told to put out there or, or what he can't even put out there, mm-hmm. you know, because of uh, national security and whatnot. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, when, while we're doing the show, when I'm interviewing, like I said, there's there's a lot of questions I'm asking about details and other things that I'm kind of cross-referencing with other guests as we're going through the, the process. And, you know, to me, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a, a bunch of details that, that are not shared in the show that they all kind of discuss and describe and talk about. And because everybody who's, you know, in our episode, you know, all of those people didn't necessarily, they weren't all friends all these years. They weren't all kind of, you know, they don't even all necessarily get along, put it that way. And so in talking to all of them, I'm pulling out truths. They don't all necessarily, um, but they haven't spoken about. And so one of those was, you know, describing a color that they've never seen before. This was a theme everybody who saw the craft described. And that is a really hard thing to imagine, which is what, you know, what is a color I've never seen before? Um, And so they describe this vibrant color that's kind of changing, but they've never seen it. They also describe the lights on the craft being extremely bright. However, like Jane Green, for instance, it's bright, but as she's close to it, the light isn't actually affecting her eyes at all. She's not squinting. She doesn't put up a hand over her face because she can't see. Tom Warner described the same thing. They're looking directly into this bright, blind, you know, quote unquote, blinding light, but it's not actually affected. They can see clearly. And so that's a very specific phenomenon um, that everyone kind of describes, uh, which to me adds a lot more credibility to their stories. These are the kind of questions that come out, you know, an hour into the interview when I'm asking very minutia, you know, about what they saw. And so that kind of, uh, that, that thread, that similarity through all the stories, to me adds a lot of credibility to the overall phenomenon yeah they all they all enjoyed their storytelling and uh, i think they all also agreed that they there was parts that were not put in there that they wish were put in there including uh, my conversation with uh, judge titus you know yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. I, I do know that you know a lot of things are out of your hand you know you do the filmmaking and they somebody else does the cutting so to speak you know what's yeah. put in what's left out and how you i just thought the way the thing even opened up with jane uh pointing across where to you know just taking you on that journey mm-hmm. you know it just it just drew you in right off the bat right thank you for that i mean that's another you know that again that was another i don't want to say technique but that was another kind of you know style to to, to bring people in immediately from the get-go and to also ground the episode around who I, who I personally thought and think is the most credible and the most genuine, the, the person with the least stakes in the game, uh, who has wisdom and looks like your aunt. You know what I mean? Like she's a very trustworthy looking human. Her delivery and how she talks is very believable. You know, it's, it's, this is not somebody who's trying to make some money off of this situation. She's got no dogs, no ducks in the race. You know what I mean? And so, her wisdom and her whole aura, I really wanted that to come across. And it just so happened that the location had these beautiful vaulted trees on both sides, these like, you know, old wisdom trees almost, you know, so putting her against that background to come in, you know, starting with the close up on the cane, all of these signals of, of wisdom, of maturity, of accomplishment, of status, you know, status in, 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 a, in the sense of like a pure human. Um, not material, obviously. This is somebody that you'd respect if you saw her in the grocery store and anywhere else. And so, you know, again, that's a small stylistic thing. It's also kind of creepy, but it's really to draw you into the storytelling and to what is about to happen. Well, Marcus, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today and like, sharing your experiences and uh, little things that weren't in the part of the show and taking a, a different look at it. I thank you very much for that. Absolutely. And thanks for having me on the podcast, man. I really appreciate having the time to talk about this. I want to thank Marcus for that fantastic interview with what went on with No Ride Home. And it really hit home to Marcus 
And this is why Black Lives Matter movement is so important. Even during the filming of No Ride Home, the thickness of the racism in the air, even in today's time, is unacceptable. Them not even looking in the shed that was there during the investigation is after Alonso's murder, and I'm going to call it a murder, and you have the FBI and uh, and everybody involved in that didn't look in the shed. Now, if this, if this was a prominent white person, I believe that shed would have been overturned. I mean, they would have they would have went through that with a toothbrush to find out, try to find out the clues. It's it's unacceptable. And for and and Marcus growing up as a black man and all his accomplishments uh, during his life is to me. Uh, I love doing stories like this. I really do. I like, that's why I did an extensive background check on Marcus. You know, I just, I just didn't want to know the man everybody knows out there as a great director. And I want to see where he came from. You know, the inside of his soul, what he had to deal with. And, and that leads you when you get a, when you get a person with that back, that, that kind of background. And, and so when it's brought to light with his work, the work he does, the people, the people he's worked with. And I want to thank Spike Lee for giving Marcus a chance, you know, so he can bring forth to the world, his talent, his vision, you know, and the people around Marcus, Doug Sackman, Justin Jenowitz, and tons of other people that worked on the set that I, I didn't interview and didn't mention, you know, the lighting and the, the, the costumes and getting the scene right. And the, the time and of 1969 things were different back then a lot different but you know the racism still exists today it didn't go nowhere it's still here you know and i want to thank marcus really i really do uh i really did enjoy this interview i have been getting a lot of emails like let's get back to the ghost let's get back to the spirits and get off this ufo stuff and you know and we will i've got two more two more parts of my eight part series I'll be back in two weeks with the uh, roundtable episode of the Berkshires. Don't miss that. That's I really pulled out some old guests and uh, paranormal investigators and podcast hosts and their views and opinions and questions on the Berkshires episode. Uh, you don't want to miss that one. That some very inter- interesting questions. Uh, and if you haven't watched the Berkshires or No Ride Home mystery on a rooftop make sure you catch those on the new netflix unsolved mysteries it's so it's really really a great series i want to take a week off i have to really uh, prepare for the next episode with a lot of uh, different people at the round table so I, I will see you in two weeks with berkshire's ufo round table discussion i'm your host al cooley Ghost in a Valley podcast.